madam dr virendra sir and also dr madhura madam you all look fantastic and that's adding luster to the entire program thank you so much and uh, here are some interesting insights regarding what is called as the tale of two countries this is the theme of my slides there are some interesting points to be made i'll just uh, allow me to make these points the indian story can be understood only from the global perspective if you look at the roach company it is pronounced as roach they have got a sales annual sales of 367500 crores that is a huge number and if you look at the pfizer company in 2022 thanks to their vaccine they made 72 billion us dollar sales and johnson and johnson which is one of the largest companies in india in the world including their non prescription portfolio their annual sales is 6,8850 crores now that is a very humongous number why i am saying this is it is very interesting to note that a distributor in us say he is just a wholesale distributor he has got 307 billion us dollars sales annual sales which is much more than pfizer or any other company so these are some interesting insights if you look at the indian picture you will see that we are also very good but probably not that high in the sales because even the biggest company sun pharma has around 30000 crore sales including their exports and you can see the other companies like sipla which has around 13000 crores dr reddy labs which has around 13000 crores this includes their exports so the pharmaceutical industry what it indicates is that we are a value for money industry third largest in volume but only 14th in terms of value we have the largest number of us fda plants outside usa 92% of anti aids medications sold worldwide is made in india we meet 50 to 60% of the global demand of vaccines and we contribute 2% of india's gdp in fact 40% of the generated in usa and 25% of any medicine in uk is all manufactured in india every third child in the globe who is vaccinated through who program is with an indian vaccine so we have become the global pharmacy of the world we are very good in our uh, entire uh, scheme of things when it comes to the different types of generics so our entire indian pharma sales is just 162000 crores whereas the entire globe uh, johnson alone has got 6 lakh crores so you can imagine what is the value for money that we provide another interesting point now that is the indian story we have become global pharmacy of the world look at the other country the other country i'm talking about is japan japan incidentally this is the cherry blossom festival which is being shown in this picture was flattened because of the atomic bombing and actually in the 1940s indian economy and the japanese economy were more or less the same but today what is japan status japan is the inventor of ivermectin the wonder drug cefepirazone cefixime ofloxacin norfloxacin famotidine cefpodoxime clarithromycin the company names are given in brackets we do not know this because we think it's the americans who have invented but actually america buys the rights from all these companies and they present it as if it's theirs even donepezil the alzheimer drug candesartan rabiprazole meropenem pioglitazone all these are from japan so japan has become the pharma innovation leader india has become the generic pharmacy leader why this change so this change has happened because in japan in the 1950s they made a strict rule that academy and industry should collaborate in projects which does not happen in india we are ivory tower academia separate and the industry separate and they also gave incentives for inventing drugs so that is how japan has gone up in the value chain so we need to do interdisciplinary approach and collaborative working and that is why group pharmaceuticals has always done that including with the rv group of institutions where we are also looking for getting into some collaborative working rv as we know is one of the leading educational institutions founded way back in 
in fact so iconic is rv that you got metro station and rv road stops and thousands of students have become the ias and ips officers cxos and directors across the globe in the who's who list you have got anil kumble asha bhat lakshmi gopal swami and so many others who are all rv products so da pandu memorial rv dental college located in a very strategic place is also creating waves because of its excellent academic programs and also research programs and we also hope that we will have lot of collaborative programs not only with group pharma with any other company also rv is going to have excellent uh, industry academy or collaborations group pharmaceuticals provides customers with best oral care and healthcare products with several first time products so definitely group pharma is there with you and i'm happy to announce that there are around 85 attendees out of the 333 attendees so i will hand it over to dr madhura madam because we are fast approaching the 100 figure dr madhura madam if you are there you can kindly take over yeah thank you sir floor is yours very good morning season's greetings to all a warm welcome to everyone present over here first let me thank mr sunil chiplinkar sir from group pharmaceuticals for the refreshing introduction we the department of oral pathology and microbiology of da pandu memorial rv dental college bengaluru karnataka present to you all an intellectual feast in the form of a national webinar to begin with may i request our beloved madam principal dr asha r ayengar to welcome the august gathering thank you madhura Good morning, one and all. Uh, on behalf of uh, the APMR Vidyapeeth College and uh, the Rashtri Shikshana Samiti Trust, I'd like to welcome all the uh, delegates here and all the participants on our webinar for this wonderful talk by uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Ra. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sunil, for having uh, uh, introduced our uh, college so wonderfully and given that introductory uh, message and. Uh, to your company uh, pharmaceuticals for supporting this webinar uh, so without much further ado i request dr virendra and dr madhura to go ahead with this webinar thank you thank you so much ma'am amidst us we have an eminent personality speaker of the day dr radhika embavli madam has completed her graduation from government dental college and hospital aurangabad in 1990 and post graduation in the specialty of oral and maxillofacial pathology and microbiology from government dental college and hospital nagpur in 1995 madam has an undergraduate teaching experience of 25 years and post graduate teaching experience of 12 years dr radhika madam has a total of 102 scientific publications to her credit which are published at journals of national and international repute Madam has contributed four chapters in four successive editions of Orban's textbook of oral histology, PG conventions, and conferences. Dr. Radhika Madam has won Best Paper Award for the scientific paper presentation on expression of PD1 and PDL1 in oral squamous cell carcinoma and leukoplakia cases, an immunohistochemical analysis based study, at 28th National Conference of Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists. held from 1st to 3rd november 2019 at kerala madam has held many reputed positions like madam has served as the honorary editor of a specialty journal that is journal of oral and maxillofacial pathology which is a pubmed index journal of our association uh, and madam has served as honorary editor for this journal from 2013 to 2016 madam has also uh, has served as executive committee member of iomp Uh, for 2010 11 and then 12 madam is the chairperson for inroad that represents national database for data collection on oral diseases and this inroad has been launched by the iomp in 2019 madam is postgraduate and phd guide uh, for rajiv gandhi university of health sciences karnataka uh, head of the department for affiliated research center to carry out doctoral thesis and work at the rajiv gandhi university of health sciences karnataka madam is the recipient of few prestigious awards and grants like 
VGST, KFIST level 2 grant from the state government of Karnataka. Madam is also recipient of the grant from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences in 2015. Madam is also recipient of the fellowship by the Fellowship Association of our Specialty, Bengaluru. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Then we have another stalwart in the field of dentistry, Dr. Virendra Kumar B. Uh, sir has graced this occasion as moderator. Sir has an undergraduate teaching experience of more than 25 years, postgraduate teaching experience of 10 years. Sir has served as executive committee member, vice president, president of Indian Dental Association and Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists. Sir has held various prestigious positions at state government and other private health science universities. Dr. Virendra Sir has many presentations and publications to his credit. Further, Sir has also contributed to various chapters in different textbooks. Sir is a postgraduate as well as PhD guide at Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Karnataka. Dr. Virendra Sir is currently working as professor and head of the Department of Oral Pathology and Microbiology at DAPM Arvind Dental College, Bengaluru. We welcome you, sir. Now I request our moderator of the session, Dr. Virendra Kumar B, to take over and conduct the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madhura. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Radhika Bawle for accepting our invitation to deliver this webinar. I hope all of you will enjoy this uh, lecture by Dr. Radhika. Over to Dr. Radhika. Please take over. The... Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for your kind words. On the onset, I would like to actually thank uh, Dr. Virendra, Dr. Asha, Madhura, then Sarita and Suma for giving me this opportunity and sharing some time with all of you. So today I will make a small presentation. Hope uh, all of you enjoy it and uh, take this journey with me. Okay. So good morning to one and all. So this uh, warm greeting comes from uh, Bangalore, from the Garden City. Absolutely a great day to all of you. So this presentation comes from the Department of uh, Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, the Krishnadev Raya College of Dental Sciences beyond uh, Yalanka in Bangalore. So today what we are going to learn and maybe you know uh, discuss and give a thought on is about varicose papillary lesions of the oral cavity. So first and foremost, generally when we choose a topic, we want to apply some thought on why we selected a topic or why we want to deliberate on it on why, or why we want to think about you know varicose papillary lesions of the oral cavity now what is interesting to know is varicose papillary lesions can actually be a diagnostic challenge because it encompasses a huge set of lesions which fall in the category of completely benign lesions they also extend their fangs into potentially malignant disorders or potentially malignant lesions and of course frank malignancies in different forms of squamous cell carcinoma or variants of squamous cell carcinoma. But then what is a problem sometimes is the use of terminologies. So a diagnostic pathologist or a clinician in any clinic or an oral pathologist or a diagnosis medicine guy or an oral surgeon should realize one thing that giving a diagnosis is very significant because it has to lead a oral surgeon towards catering of the right treatment and gives a good thought about prognosis and sequelae or the natural history of the disease itself. So there are a lot of clinical terms and histopathological terms which are used. So today I also want to you know, get some clarity on these terms and thoughts with all of you. So all of us are actually, uh, we know what papillary lesions are because we have normal papillary structures in the oral cavity. And when you see a slide of, you know, a filiform papillae, so that's a classical papillary structure which we have on the tongue, which covers most of the areas of, you know, the dorsum of the tongue, which we know uh, very clearly as an architectural type of pattern. So very similar to these papillary structures, we get a lot of pathologies which are associated with papillary structures or you know, papillary uh, rounded off uh, structures with different degrees of ortho and parakeratinization. So today we will look at a good spectrum of varicopapillary lesions. 
Now, these lesions have basically been classified by a number of uh, workers in the field of diagnostic medicine and oral pathology. So let us understand what are these classification about. One of the oldest classification comes from Eversole and Papanicolo. So this is in the year 1983, which actually focuses on telling us, you know, whether how many number of lesions are you seeing and what is the appearance of this lesion. So if you have small, single, focal papillary lesions, so in this category, you see, you know, solo squamous papillomas or viral warts or verica vulgaris. And then the second category is focal umbilicated. So focal umbilicated are those lesions which we generally ideally would love to call by the name of, you know, cupped lesions or lip lesions like keratoacanthoma, which very abruptly form in a papule. And then in the crater of the papule, you can get hyperkeratinization in the form of keratin horns, which actually sometimes look papillary. So these lesions also peep into this category sometimes in the form of, you know, uh, keratoacanthomas and molluscum contagiosum. And the next category is multifocal diffuse. Multifocal papillary diffuse are patchy, you know, uh, growths which might show papillary, you know, uh, fronds or sharp papillary structures which are at multiple sites or extend over centimeters or extend on multiple areas of the mucous membrane. So a classical example for these lesions would be like proliferative varicose leukoplakia or varicose carcinoma itself. And then you have diffuse polypoid papillary lesions. So these actually a distinction is made in these diseases because you will invariably find, you know, polypoidal button-like structures, which are multiple small vegetative growths on the oral mucous membrane. So in this category, we should be very clear that they very rarely have anything to do with carcinomas. They are more to do with, you know, diseases like uh, Hex disease or Cowden's disease, or this is because of, you know, a non-malignant uh, growth which are multiple at site and have a much better prognosis. The second classification is given by Eversole in 2000. Now this is a very interesting classification because at that point of time it was believed that HPV virus actually is the etiology causative and all and none of all the varicopapillary lesions. So in that conjunction all the uh, lesions are classified into HPV positive lesions and HPV negative lesions. So the fun here is the HPV positive lesion weighs very, very heavy because you have HPV associations in verica vulgaris, squamous papillomas, varicose carcinomas, and, uh, you know, condyloma accumulatum. Uh, you have association of HPV, which is not a small bracket, uh, you know, group of more than 200 viruses, which are divided into alpha and beta variants. So all of that comes into this category. And interesting is HPV negative. So you have some subtle diseases like squamous papilloma, which are completely negative of HPV associations. You have varicoform xanthoma, which can be put in this category. So this was the second classification that was given by Everso. Now let us come to some classifications which we can you know, use for diagnosis and, you know, prognostification and uh, which can actually convey good meaning to the clinician or to the oral surgeon for treatment modalities he or she wants to consider. So this was given by Regezi in 2003. So this is based on etiological factor, which actually makes a lot of, uh, you know, impact because you have reactive papillary lesions. Then, you know, there is a cause which you have to treat or remove or lessen. And then you treat and you have a good prognosis for such lesions like papillary, you know, uh, growths on the palate because of trauma or because of smoking. Then you have neoplastic growths, which actually encompasses proliferative varicose leukoplakia and uh, varicose carcinomas, right? The prognosis of which becomes guarded. Then you have idiopathic lesions like silenoma papilliferum or Verisiform xanthomas, which are actually offbeat lesions, quite rare, but carry a good prognostication, which are quite local pathologies. One such classification is also, you know, put forward by Thomas and Barrett in 2009. So this actually not only speaks of etiology, it speaks of characterization of these lesions based on the potential of le these lesions. So whether, you know, you have a benign lesion, that is associated with HPV 6 or 11, which might have an association with squamous cell carcinoma also,
but they are classically benign lesions like squamous papilloma or verruca vulgaris then the second category is potentially malignant disorders specifically proliferative varicose leukoplakia which takes off most of the bulk in this category and the last category is varicose carcinoma and maybe different variants of squamous cell carcinoma itself so these are the number of classifications which allow us a better understanding of varicopapillary lesions so much before we go into varicopapillary lesions everyone knows that you know varicopapillary lesions mean lesions which are cauliflower like which have finger like extension so that is a no all point for everyone whether you're a clinician oral pathologist or any other specialty in dentistry now there is one more reference we need to add to this lesion so that it makes more sense for us to understand what type of a growth this is so if you look at the first block here this actually shows you a reference of normal mucous membrane and the retinage level for the normal mucous membrane so in this pathology where the retinages do not go below the length or the dimension of the normal retinages do not invade into the lamina propria or don't you know uh, invade in the areas of deeper connective tissue and grow completely as a exophytic lesion they might also have connective tissue core enclosures right now these are generally classical pattern of growth for benign lesions in the form of squamous papilloma now a next instance is you have slightly larger you know lesions which spread across the mucous membrane they might be in the form of sharp papillary growths which have good amount of keratinization or they might have balded papillary growths in the form of fronds but still the important point is the dimension of the retinages doesn't go deeper than the dimension of a normal reference of the mucous membrane so these are the lesions which fall into the category of what we might like to make impressive in the form of verrucous hyperplasias now when we think of that one more term seeps into the mind of a oral pathologist where you have papillary you know extensions either in the form of fronds or you know spikes or spicules and then you do not see great extension of the retinages you know you know which invades into the lamina propria but you see cut areas of tangential you know growths into the area of lamina propria so this is what we want to call as pseudo epithelomatous hyperplasia this might be because of a reactive lesion this might be because of squamous cell carcinoma progression at a later date you can see it in both scenarios but this is what reference you should be holding when you want to call something as you know that this is pseudo epithelomatous hyperplasia not really be worrisome at this point of view and at the same time then quickly you come to a lesion where you see a exophytic growth that goes away from the surface of epithelium and a endophytic growth that comes lavishly punching into the deeper areas of lamina propria and the submucosa also one more point i would like to make you know here is please remember in such lesions very rarely you get encyclement or you know a uh, uh, cores of connective tissue entrapped in the epithelium because these lesions grow downwards endophytic in generally a sheet pattern that is what is considered kind of invasion on the deeper connective tissue which we classically get to see in cases of verrucous carcinomas right and the last but not the least the most important you can have exophytic you can have endophytic growth retinages at a lower level or at the same level but there is breach in the basement membrane and invasion a proper invasion into the connective tissue so these are the lesions which we want to call by any name in the variant but these are cases of squamous cell carcinoma so these are some of the illustrations which i want all the clinicians to hold in mind because it gives an easy concept for us to think what this lesions might be so based on this i would like to go ahead and just take you quickly through a small cascade of benign lesions which we clinicians get to see not only in the department of oral pathology but in the clinics in private practices very frequently so some of them are verruca vulgaris squamous papillomas you get to see good number of cases of these and then condyloma acuminatus then you get to see focal epithelial hyperplasias in the form of head diseases which is quite rare 
and of course fibroepithelial polyps which are very frequently seen in the oral cavity because they are seen as reactive lesions which might be papillary in you know or papillomatous in form varices form xanthomas and sialadenoma papillifera which are associated with the minor salivary gland so let's have a quick look of who these guys are and what they look like so verruca vulgaris as the name itself tells you it is a you know a virus associated lesion which is very very small most of the time do not grow larger than 1 cm commonest sites are the outer rim of the oral cavity so lips palate are the common site for the verruca vulgaris uh, and classically you will see that they are uh, sessile they might have a small base though the borders are very well demarcated and very discreet and what you get to see in histopathology is you have a very abrupt transition from the normal epithelium and then you see that the retinal edges grow humongously you know towards the center of the lesion so you almost feel that the retinal edges whether they are coalescing or non coalescing are pointing towards the center of the lesion so they also show the presence of you know keratin plugging and viral association because of the nuclear clearing you get to see coalescitic changes in verruca vulgaris and also you know uh, structures which look very close to mitotic figures which are called as mitosoid cells this is because of the virus association right so this is a classical look but you can see that they abruptly stop there is no extension lot of number of times you get to see a good inflammatory response which is sub epithelial which is a mixed inflammatory response which you see below the lesion a good you know a surgical removal with a very small border is actually a choice of treatment for these verruca vulgaris the next one is a squamous papilloma so these again are on the similar side you can get it on the lips you can get it on the vestibular mucosa on the alveolar ridge and these are small growths which are classically exophytic might show more keratin so you can see the church spire kind of appearance on a clinical presentation itself and lot many times they are classically pedunculated or have a stop because of the which you can move the lesion in your tweezer actually so it's very close to look you know easy to look at the base of this lesions so invariably they will actually show there is a small difference between what histologically squamous papillomas might show you they will actually show long extensions and finger like projections which actually encompass connective tissue cores and they might be well keratinized in the form of para and more predominantly ortho keratinization and then like i told a abrupt change into the normal epithelium at the periphery and completely almost normal looking connective tissue so there is no endophytic element but you can have some amount of inflammation and most of these lesions because of the keratin plugging can be associated with passive fungal hyphae or fungal infection in most of the cases of squamous papillomas or verrucas also the next is a condyloma acuminata so instead of seeing them as classically spiky white lesions with finger like projection they are more seen as solo lesions or multiple lesions on the lip mostly thought to be you know uh, spread because of sexual transmission but now we understand the transmission can be skin to skin mucous membrane to skin and various modes of transmission can happen because of uh, the virus which gets associated with condyloma acuminata so you have slightly slightly large papillomatous lesion which look pinkish white so that itself tells you they do not really carry loads of keratin on the surface though they might show you keratin filled crypts or keratin plugging but invariably the epithelium might show good amount of acanthosis and merging of retinal edges but they are completely devoid of features of dysplasia so a very similar lesion to this is a focal epithelial hyperplasia so this is in the form of you know multiple lesions classically very rarely you see them as solo lesions you will see multiple small buttle or you know button like you know umbilicated lesions on the mucous membrane so these fronds look quite bald and quite you know toned down so you do not see lot of keratin in them but you get to see growth of the retinal edges because of acanthosis basal cell hyperplasia and very less of dysplastic changes so the association of hpv is in the form of virus 13 and 32 in cases of hex disease and the other one is like i told 
you know, reactive lesions in the form of what you want to call as fibroepithelial polyps or pyogenic granulomas. These are reactive lesions very, very commonly seen in the oral cavity. We all know the cause is generally irritation or trauma. Now, these lesions can end up to be papillary or nodular. And because of constant friction, they can actually develop papillary outgrowths or chevrons, which are actually well keratinized. The clue comes because you will see the you know, role of fibrous connective tissue, which is more like a healing tissue with a good vascular element in the connective tissue, inflammation, and of course, melanin incontinence. And along with epithelium, which has also you know, uh, proliferated, there is hyperplasia, but absolutely no signs of dysplasia. So this is a classical fibroepithelial epithelial polyp as a reactive lesion. And then you get some lesions like verisipam xanthoma, which are also actually, you know, provisionally diagnosed as, you know, uh, condyloma acuminata or some of those, you know, pinkish white lesions. But when you see the biopsy, you get complete clarity because you get a exophytic lesion, which has, you know, kind of verrucous, uh, either sharp or flat topped borders, which show good amount of parakeratinization and, you know, plugging of keratin also. But the secret sits hiding in between the coalescing areas of the retiridges in the superficial area of the connective tissue. The lamina propria shows you the presence of pale histiocytes, which are, you know, laden with vacuoles. So a very pale looking uh, foamy histiocytic infiltration subepithelially classically speaks of a diagnosis of verisiform xanthomas. Now, Human papilloma virus, the association of these lesions, you know, is said to be etiological in the old school of thought. But these days we should understand that this might be more to do with association. And this I will tell you because invariably we feel that this might be because they are cofactor in development of lesions. I would not like to say they have no role to play in these lesions, but they are cofactor. They might be sharing the etiological factor with other reasons for the formation of lesion. So in oral cavity, the you know scenario gets much more complicated because that becomes very clear. For example, all the HPV virus are actually classified as either alpha category and beta category. So classically, if you pay attention, all alpha categories are seen to be related with mucous membrane, or viral growth or viral verrucas, and all beta viruses are associated with skin lesions or warts or you know nevi on the skin. But what is the peculiarity of the oral cavity? Oral cavity scenes verrucas, squamous papillomas that are associated with alpha HPV virus also, and the beta HPV virus also. So you see the association of both forms of HPV virus. Now, what is the role of these viruses? Let it be strain number 2, 6, 16, 13, of which we are much more scared of. Invariably, you will see a breach in epithelium allows the virus to get into the keratinocytes, starts forming viral proteins, which are getting assembled in a maturing keratinocytes. And the key role comes to be played by protein number E6 and E7, which actually tamper with the normal apoptosis and cell proliferation cycles because of the blockade of, you know, RB area and P53 gene. So this allows the formation of papillary growths or hyperplasia or acanthosis, the kind of varicopapillary growths that you get to see in cases of HPV-associated papillomatous growths. So this is a small table of association of HPV viruses in the head and neck. So this itself clears that verruca is associated with 2, 4, 40. What is interesting is HPV 6 and 11 are associated with squamous papillomas and condyloma acuminata, but they have no features of dysplasia. They have no sequelae to be associated with any malignancies. The same viruses are also associated with low-grade varicose carcinomas. And the high-grade carcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas are associated with, you know, strains 16 and 18. And in some diseases which are unique, like the Hex disease or multifocal epithelial hyperplasia, you have the association of HPV virus 13 and 16. So this is just a sum up of cofactors in these pathologies. So if you look at the lineup for benign lesions, what do you need to follow as a clinician? I got a small varicose lesion which is pedunculated, no, which is sessile, 
no bit which is very well contained let's go by the rule of 1 One centimeter, a wee bit more or wee bit less. Exophyte it completely. You can hold it in your tweezer and lift it. Believe me, they are viral varicocapillary lesions. They have no connotations of dysplasia. They might be solo or maybe two lesions, but they can be very clearly and easily treated by surgical excision. So this is like biopsy treatment excisions, which you can use as a lineup for treatment of you know benign varicocapillary lesions. the whole scenario changes when we get into the bracket of potentially malignant disorders so much before i elucidate what are these potentially malignant disorders let us take a small journey please i would want to invite all of you to take a small journey of understanding in this so let us look at the literature for some time and then i saw that there are a lot of climbs and falls in the history of you know varicocapillary lesions as potentially malignant lesions so the oldest comes from a reference of rosenthal in 48 where he clearly makes a mention of a papillary variant of varic you know varicocyte carcinoma which he says that doesn't really go to the lymph node looks like squamous cell carcinoma but looks much much more contained so a better definition to rosenthal's view came from hackerman in the same year by introduction of the term varicose carcinoma which stays rock solid even today as a classically exoendophytic growth which is a variant of squamous cell carcinoma definitely with a much better prognosis the clarity of this term from 48 till 2022 remains very clear but in 1960 rock and fisher introduced a term of florid oral papillomatosis now this is where the train you know kind of gets derailed in thoughts because then we do not know what they are talking of because then there are a lot of reports where you see florid oral papillomatosis which are actually kind of you know uh, hex disease also and there are a lot of varicose carcinomas and pvls also which are reported under this category so today actually this is actually a category of or a terminology that is not really used not a safe term to be utilized to give a proper idea to a surgeon or a service provider in a clinic now in 1958 ackerman and magraven actually introduced the term of varicose hyperplasia so varicose hyperplasia was the first term which got introduced into the you know category of potentially malignant diseases in varicocapillary lesions so this gained some amount of you know Uh, uh clarity and insight which cascaded into the thought of development and understanding of a lesion which is called as varicose leukoplakia today called as proliferative varicose leukoplakia thanks to hansen in 1958 so varicose hyperplasia has traveled a long term from 58 to 85 to develop into a clearer concept of proliferative varicose leukoplakia which have been called by different names by Atkin and Monser and Shear and Pintgor as varicose leukoplakia Wang still attempted a clarity by telling that we can have plaque type and mass type only to realize later that the plaque type which he is talking of is exactly same what Hansen describes as PVL or proliferative varicose leukoplakia So 2000 onwards it is good because we are not stressing on names and in introducing much more confusing terms we are spending time on detailing of the natural history of this disease what is the potential of these diseases and what is the sequelae so let us start our journey with varicose hyperplasia so this concept came in those lesions where the retinaceous do not really go below into the lamina propria there is keratosis but you cannot rule out different forms of dysplasia so this was you know used extensively as a clinical diagnosis also and a histopathological diagnosis for that time maybe it was correct so then you get clarity that there are sharp varieties of varicose hyperplasia where there is heavy orthokeratinization with spikes and chevrons you know and then you have you know dulled out blunt variety which are broader and shorter and show less keratinization but then both of these do not have a great connotation related to prognosis but they might be just called as histological variants of varicose hyperplasia but do we want to you know stress on it as a clinical term or a histopathological term let's go ahead and pay attention 
because then some criteria got framed with, with you know uh, thomas kellerical and he says if there is increased keratinization sharp or decreased keratin but blunt processes then you have a varicose surface the lamina propria doesn't get invaded and then you should have absence of epithelial dysplasia this is what sets a tone of differentiation so then you end up in a scenario where you have varicose hyperplasia with absence of dysplasia so then we maybe we are thinking of varicose hyperplasias that are inflammatory or reactive in lesion dysplasia mild dysplasia or great dysplasia in lesions where you are thinking of proliferative varicose leukoplakias actually so here comes the you know clarity so generally if you use the term for diagnosis as varicose hyperplasia please be very careful because you might be talking of a pmd you can be talking of carcinoma in situ when you get to see the slide and shockingly you might be seeing an invasive squamous cell carcinoma itself so definitely varicose hyperplasia is not a great term to be used as a clinical term or a diagnostic term it is unsatisfactory as a histopathological diagnosis also right so some people use the term as varicose hyperkeratosis this is just a term of detailing which can be used so you just want to tell there is varicose growth with good amount of keratinization so whatever be the cause there is no clarity but it is a descriptive term which can be used as a part of your histopathological reporting varicose leukoplakia can be a clinical diagnosis but then when you look at the slide you can actually end up seeing it as a varicose hyperplasia or a varicose carcinoma or invasive squamous cell carcinoma so unless it is used with the right criteria it cannot be a descriptive term that you can use for final diagnosis certainly not for histopathological diagnosis or a diagnostic pathology this can be used as a term for provisional diagnosis by a clinician so then why does this concept change so why there is so much of unclarity with varicose hyperplasia this ended up because of understanding of a uh, concept of field cancerization where you get to see you know that varicose hyperplasia where we use this term and made a diagnosis 18 to 68% of them showed various forms of dysplasia you know from mild moderate to severe shockingly 20 to 24% are actually cases of malignant squamous cell carcinoma so then whatever was being used by sheer or pinbog or wang as you know plaque type or mass type like i told most of the plaque type ended as lesions which had full recognition as proliferative varicose leukoplakia so all these terms have become obsolete now and are not really used but this opens in our mind a concept of field cancerization so then is the birth of the lesion which is actually treacherous unlike its appearance in the oral cavity which is called by the name of proliferative varicose leukoplakia now this name has stuck to the gun till today the lot of us feel that the correct name or the more appropriate name for this is proliferative leukoplakia itself because like you can see in the clinical picture here this is actually pvl but it is in a plaque form you know it has not really generated in a varicose form so please remember pvl presents as a pvl or a varicose growth as the end point or the last phase of development of pvl it does not start in the format of a varicose lesion so this kind of pathology is associated with women more frequently than men for is to one ratio commonest sites which are rare in association with other you know tobacco associated lesions this is seen on the gingiva on the palate lateral borders of tongue more associated with non habitual guys or ladies who do not have a history of tobacco usage unfortunately has conversion rate close to 100% so this lesion got some clarity because of rating and grading like i told because starts as a plaque hansen et al made a you know attempt to categorize it into 10 grades so depending on that you know in which stage of progression pvl is but much before i elaborate on hansen et al i would actually want to elaborate on serrero lepidra's criteria 
which is a very good classification or criteria to be used when you want to make a diagnosis of PVL in clinical cases. So you have multiple criteria here, but if you get three of the major criteria, you know, uh, in your favor or two major and two minor criteria, then you can make a diagnosis of PVL. Now, what is so different about PVL? Let's remember conventional leukoplakia, especially in our country, go into regression at a very good rate, more than 60%. And only conversion rate is close to, you know, three to seven or 9.5%, which is the highest I got to see. But PVLs shockingly have a progression rate or malignant transformation rate you know, in different countries, but all of them wavering between 50 to 100 percent. And most of the early regions are deceiving. 84 percent of them actually showed very mild dysplasia. So you and me are actually going to write it as low risk lesions if we use, you know, the Kujan's classification and put the clinician off the track of taking extensive treatment or follow up this for these lesions. So what is this serolipidrus criteria? So these are the criteria which are in the form of five major criteria. So if you use two or three major criteria, very important to pay attention on E because that is mandatory to be one of your criteria to make the diagnosis. Here comes the crux of the cat. So here you can see they can be histologically either varicose hyperplasias with no dysplasia or mild dysplasias they might be carcinoma in C2s, they might be varicose carcinoma or invading squamous cell carcinomas itself. Same again, the minor criteria, as you can see, patient is a lady, do not smoke, there is no habit of chew. I would actually go one step ahead for Indian patients. This actually should tell Indian clinician, male or female, but does not smoke or chew. That word is very important, which is missing in criteria, which we have to introduce for ourselves. And you get evolution of the disease and it is there for, you know, maybe some three to five years of time. So if you have two major, two minor or three major criteria which get satisfied, you can go in for a diagnosis of proliferative varicose leukoplakia. Like I told, the florid oral papillomatosis becomes an obsolete term because if they are associated with, you know, uh, varicose lesions which are pointing towards PVNs or varicose carcinoma, then their prognosis we know. So these terms are not used in associations with PMDs and malignancies. One or two rare instances where you get lesions like this, where you have small button or papillary lesions, like in hex disease, only in these instances for a clinical diagnosis, you can use the term of florid oral papillomatosis, but you will have to come with a much more firmer histopathological diagnosis at a later date. Now, looking at the malignancies which are very papillary in nature, right? Let's go ahead and see what we get to witness. So the first, like I told, Ackerman has given complete classical picture of a lesion, which is, you know, classical cauliflower-like growth, which might look pinkish white, like it is on the upper nodule, or completely white with, you know, chevrons and classical hyperorthokeratosis. So these are classical growths of architectural pattern, exophytic and endophytic. Please remember a sheet pattern growing with elephant feet retiriges. So these are called as carcinomas, not because basement membrane is broken and they go invading like conventional squamous cell carcinoma. These are carcinomas because they pound on into the lamina propria, submucosa, can invade into the bone and even cause crateriform defects on the bone. So that's the reason we call them as carcinomas. Right here, we get a good inflammatory response in the subepithelial area. The classical description of the epithelium, let's remember, very few signs of great dysplasia. So you might have basal cell hyperplasia. You might have few mitotic figures in the basal cell area. But otherwise, there are no great atypical cells or great amount of, you know, dysplastic features in a classical diagnosis of varicose carcinoma. Now, what happens when you see varicose carcinoma with the anaplastic transformation? So if in your biopsy, you are seeing a varicose carcinoma, 
the epithelium is showing you know top to bottom this plastic changes but in your slide like in this slide there is no connective tissue to appreciate much and then you want to say that how come so much of dysplasia in varicose carcinoma please you can make a diagnosis of varicose carcinoma but you should be very careful to follow it up with a line please rule out invasive squamous cell carcinoma please do a clinical pathological correlation if you have so much of anaplasia in the epithelium it has gone beyond the stage of a simple varicose carcinoma of good prognosis no nodal metastasis right some instances you get to see a mention of variants of varicose carcinoma in the name of carcinoma cuniculatum now carcinoma cuniculatum itself is called like i told by confusing terms oral floral papillomatosis we should come out of that term inverted varicose carcinoma is something that you want to remember in your mind but the term to be used is carcinoma cuniculatum and please let us get it out of this category it is actually a variant of squamous cell carcinoma just like varicose carcinoma if you get invasion in a classical case which you diagnosed as varicose carcinoma clinically please let us be clear let us not make diagnosis of atypical features in a varicose carcinoma hybrid tumor with squamous please this actually betrays the patient of a good treatment for squamous cell carcinoma you need to make a diagnosis of invasive squamous cell carcinoma you can always put a note maybe preluded by the formation of varicose carcinoma or benign varicopapillary growth or potentially malignant disorder in the form of a pvl but the permanent first line diagnosis by our oral pathologist if you see invasion please make a mention you are seeing it at this stage on this day as invasive squamous cell carcinoma so the classical picture in varicose carcinoma is an abrupt transition zone so if you do not see a abrupt transition zone please be careful is there a pmd lurking is there a pvl associated with the varicose carcinoma take a call based on the transition zone if you are getting to see it in your slide right invasion call it squamous cell carcinoma hybrid tumors not a great term no practical purpose and if you ask me deceives you much more than leads the surgeon on to the right mode of treatment so please remember the more apt names for a oral pathologist or a clinician to use is varicose carcinoma or is it squamous cell carcinoma these are two independent terms but if you give a diagnosis of varicose the treatment modalities are fixed if you give a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma you know about the prognosis and treatment differences those lesions will actually invite so let us stick to these two you know terminologies much more loyally to the other so some instances people tell that you know these look very similar please don't forget they might cascade into you know varicose hyperplasias are actually cascading into pvls or varicose carcinomas but a lot of people feel to start with you might see them you know in tied down mucosas meaning gingiva and palate like i told pvls you get to see on gingiva growth patterns is exophytic in varicose hyperplasia but very quickly it can become endophytic and it can go into varicose carcinoma there is no marked atypia or features of dysplasia in both the categories including proliferative varicose lymphoplakia so where does this get us when we see merging borders then we realize is there so much of confusion is the cause of this conundrum of you know confusing terminologies because it is a spectrum now it is very clearly proved by more than you know half a dozen researchers like you know slutweg or batsaki is hansens and belaris all of them who say that if you see varicose hyperplasia be cautious after a couple of years you might see it at see it as pvl and maybe it will go into progression as varicose carcinomas so pvls themselves might begin with varicose hyperplasias end up with varicose carcinoma so these are a spectrum of disease so if you tell pvl you can never really get out of the theory of field cancerization and squamous cell carcinoma so recall multiple biopsies is inevitable let's not feel guilty about it let's do it and do the right thing because we are in a spectrum disease of involvement 
So papillary variant of squamous cell carcinoma is also a classical variant where you get to see papillary growths, right? Now, these are some of the lesions which look like, you know, uh, pebbly, which might show keratin, which might not show a lot of keratin, but all of them show invasion into the connective tissue. So please remember papillary growths, which might enclose connective tissue pores like a squamous papilloma. But the whole of the epithelium thickness shows dysplasia. You have a scenario like carcinoma in C2. And then you see classic invasion like in squamous cell carcinoma. So your diagnosis is invasive squamous cell carcinoma, papillary variant of OSCC. So some people use terms like papillary dysplasia or papillary carcinoma. Please remember there are no separate terms for papillary lesions in the oral lesions by WHO. It is plain and simple, papillary variant of squamous cell carcinoma. That is the term we should go in for, for clarity and understanding. So coming to the Indian scenario. So this is always interesting for me, what we read and what we learn about, you know, uh, all these uh, data and articles. So what is, how does this matter in my country, in your city and my city? So let us understand HPV associations are huge in our country also so much so that 7 to 10 percent of all individuals without lesions are also HPV carriers in our country. So benign lesions, there is an association of HPV. Is it a primary causative? That is quite questionable. Now these associations in benign lesions also have a different kind of connotation in different countries. For example, if you see pediatric patients who will show verruca vulgaris in the oral cavity or on the gingiva, then the first thing uh, you know, a clinician in America thinks of is sexual abuse in these children. So then the whole you know, uh, uh, format of you know, uh, protocol of looking at the patient and how you deal with these patients become entirely different. But let me tell you in our country, the spread of HPV infections is oral to you know a mucosal to skin skin to skin mucosa to mucosa it can be seen because of health providers nurses paramedical staffs clinicians service providers uh, because of breastfeeding so many non-sexual activities so hpv association you cannot really tell is you know association is present but you cannot really tell these are all associated with you know assaults or other forms, but HPV association with malignant lesions, then you need to open your eyes because HPV 16 and 18 are actually having a strong association, not only with uterine cancers, they have an association with oral cancers in the form of squamous cell carcinoma. But here also in varicose carcinoma, is it a causative? Not really, but what is the good news here? It is nice, it is wise even to go in for a HPV vaccination, especially for all individuals who are young, because you have, uh, you know, quadra uh, placent and you have nano placent, H, uh, uh, you know, and nine plus HPV vaccines. So all of these takes off the power of HPV 16 and 18. And then there's an interesting story, which I want to tell you guys, where I can tell you that, you know, all of us took uh, Corona, uh, you know, COVID vaccines. So we all ended up with two or three bouts of vaccines. Now I'm sure a lot of you will tell that this is a funny part of our lives where you know we used to have cold and suffer cold for seven days and then it used to go whether you take medication or not. When suddenly these days you see I got a cold which vanished in one day. So the coronavirus actually you know the vaccine took care of many variants of the sub viruses and kills down the capacity of you know, uh, viruses which actually cause cold also. Same is the case with HPV. So though this HPV is potent against 16, 18, and maybe 6 and 11 in benign formats, it will subdue the effects of all the other variants like 2, 10, 30, 33. And most of these viral lesions undergo resolutions which if you have taken a HPV vaccination. Right. The next is PVL. PVL is something we have to keep our eyes open in our country because we might be looking at cases of boys and girls who have PVL, do not have a history of tobacco usage. We do not find any dysplasia 
it is time to open our eyes and put them on long recalls if needed you know put them on treatment modalities which will see that you know at least the disease does not go into a state of progression but you should be ready to biopsy at a later date to look into these lesions in what state they are so then they can be treated appropriately this is one diagnosis which i would like to you know uh, i might be right or wrong but generally please mention this diagnosis even if you are seeing a case of squamous cell carcinoma please mention pvl association because it gives clarity to the clinician of field cancerization meaning you can get recurrence also you might get a new lesion somewhere else also so that is a learning about pvl in our country next is varicose carcinoma so sometimes there is some fashionable virus and we jump on to the bandwagon of the virus like hpv uh, even today it is not very clear uh, no one is ready to vouch that 16 and 18 actually cause you know carcinomas like varicose carcinoma but what i can tell you is now there are more articles which come on the involvement of microbiota so these days we know the bacteria might be much more important in virus than varicose carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas so you have some set of bacteria like you know firmicutes or bacteroids or proteobacteroids these are all small you know alchemy guys so these guys manipulate the local environment and actually activate the carcinogens on the mucous membrane for example they can very quickly convert you know alcohols into carcinomatous aldehydes so these day people believe microbiota in specific classes might be playing a much stronger role than the virus in the scenario of these varicopapillary carcinomas so the molecular aspect so uh, a histopathological diagnosis is quite you know distinct in cases of varicose carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma but some instances you can you know use uh, cell kinetics where you see proliferation only in basal cell area which quite, it is quite contrary in oscc that extends to the full thickness right and lot of studies happening of you know pv associations and like i told oral microbiota a whole lot of molecular markers are studied in association with varicose carcinomas starting from p53 63 then connective tissue markers mmps and all so this might be used in association with prognostication but not many of them are actually useful for categorization or classification of the lesion but they might add value in the prognostication and response to treatment in cases of varicose carcinoma and oscc now uh it was all good i have eaten up enough of your time along with this discussion some of you might feel that you know this was a lot of theory which radhika madam taught us i agree with you so sometimes i tell that if i have read so much let's test the waters so today it's always good to you know sit and sign a report of squamous papilloma which is so simple and so neat so i want you to quickly take you through some of the cases so this category i want to call it the twist of varicopapillary lesions so if it stands straight on the foot it's easy to diagnose you can you know breathe easy but what happens when it takes a flip so this was a case which came to me as a referral case and the surgeon told the pathologist general pathologist has given me a diagnosis of excessively keratinizing odontogenic cyst and this is a clinical picture i get to see where i see a, you know a kind of cavitation in the maxillary alveolus but i see a small ulcero proliferative growth on the alveolus and then it is crossing the midline and most of the teeth on the right side also the anteriors are quite mobile as you can see the extent there is good amount of destruction of bone which is ill defined but the clinician actually shocked me when he sent me the grossing so he told madam this just came out in toto almost like a cyst it shelled out and to my surprise is when i cut it you you know actually could make out in you know the core area or on the peripheral area this was actually a cystic lesion which had actually ruptured into the oral cavity so let us have a look of what this lesion is going to show us so this is a lesion you see the surface epithelium which looks almost close to normal then you see a eversion into a 
varicopapillary lesion that is completely turned inside into the cavity. Here you can see the close vicinity of this lesion to the bone. So this lesion is actually growing in trousers. So this lesion actually showed us dyskeratosis, varicopapillary growths, then you get to see keratin pearls, everything, but you know, lot of areas screened and then uh, no great invasion could be seen and not much of dysplasia. But then when you go hunting, you see better fields which clarify, you know, what type of growth you are seeing. So then the retiridges are elephant feet, you have classical keratin plugging, and slowly you get into the bracket of, am I looking at varicose carcinoma? And then we got some areas which you know clearly showed the presence of invasion into the connective tissue. So this lesion which came as you know excessively keratinizing OKC or odontogenic cyst, got signed as squamous cell carcinoma. Now, I do not really know whether there was a original cyst in the cavitation, which was much more benign, and the growth of varicose carcinoma seeped into the passage of, you know, pathway of least resistance. That's why there's no cortical expansion here, though it has gone deeper into the bone. And that's the reason maybe why it shelled out so easily like a benign lesion. But the diagnosis here was given as squamous cell carcinoma because that is exactly how we need to treat the patient. So this is a case where I will take you forward and then get you backward because this is what happens to a lot of us. So the surgeon just, you know, sends you some specimen and is not ready to share the detail with you. So this came as a case of a Delhi gentleman who has been repeatedly treated for destructive osteomyelitis. So I was shocked when I saw the mandible, the whole of the ramus is gone, right? There is no ramus at all. There is some body and it has been dissected as a hemimandibulectomy specimen. Lot of necrotic particles. So we, of course, took it up for biopsy and we took up these areas which are clinging to the, you know, ragged edges of the bone also for biopsy. So this imaging shows you something has just eaten this up. So then in the COVID time, the first thing that comes thumping into your head is mucor mycosis. So good, this is the case that I'm going to see on slide today. This is a fungal infection with loads of osteomyelitis and osteonecrosis also. And then let me show you, I told, once I saw the slide, the first thing as you do as emergency is call up the clinician and tell, please tell me how was this lesion? I want to see the clinical pic. I want all detailing of the previous reports. So then I get to see there is no varicose growth here. There is a healing scar, which actually, you know, exudes pus because of the osteonecrosis and, you know, osteomyelitis. More than twice the patient has been treated for osteomyelitis and they say there is no evidence of malignancy. Rightly so, when I saw loads of slides, they showed me loads of necrosis, hemorrhage, granulation tissue, bacterial colonies, and maybe some hyphae of degenerating collagen, which I want to believe that let's do a pass. These are the fungal hyphae. But when I went and looked up the slides of, you know, the tissue clumps which were stuck to the bone, this is what I got to see. So the picture is very clear. You all know what you are looking at. So you are seeing invasion and you then see some tracks in that which is like plugged with keratin. So you get to see such tracks with papillary extensions. So you get to see... This is a varicopapillary lesion that is inverted downwards into the face or maybe from the skin or mucous membrane, I am not aware, but it is growing inwards. It is not growing exophytic. So when you look at more areas, then you get to see the whole lesion has, you know, a trunk and multiple branches which goes burrowing into the depths of the bone and connective tissue and you see constant you know uh, base of resorption on the bone also so then you realize what you're looking at is the burrowing defects that you very get to you know very classically get to see in cases of carcinoma cunicular terms so just like you tell a rodent ulcer goes invading deep 
cuniculatum goes burrowing down with this keratin filled tracts and then you see the conventional features of squamous cell carcinoma so the diagnosis went in as squamous cell carcinoma carcinoma cuniculatum this is again an unfortunate case which has taught me so much so this was a case of a 16 or 18 year old boy who came with two reports of treated cases of OKC. So the first report mentioned that there was a OKC with hyper and parakeratosis. And the second report says recurrence of OKC and we see a solid variant of OKC. And what do we get to see? We get to see after three to five years, a oroantral fistula, some healing scars, and then you see why has the patient come? The patient says, I have great amount of discomfort in this area. So when you lift the lip, you get to see there is a varicopapillary growth on the alveolar ridge, on the palate, and some cascading onto the gingiva also. So to my surprise, the clinician told this tooth is already mobile. So anyway, with the biopsy, I'm going to send you this tooth with some clinging soft tissue. So then... You start thinking, where is the OKC and what am I looking at? And so everyone keeps asking, what is your diagnosis? What is your diagnosis? So then you say he has pain and this is a treated case. So maybe some osteomyelitis, the way it is growing, maybe some fungal infection, deep-seated, long-standing fungal infection. Then you go ahead and look at the X-ray. So you have destruction of bone but you have a healing phase of the bone also. So then you do not know what to make out or what sense to add from this imaging. Let's get it from our slide. So the slide classically showed a varicopapillary lesion which just like beats you and tells, if you do not know what a varicopapillary lesion looks like, this is how I look with you know loads and loads of keratin plugging in between the papillary areas. And then you get to see, you know, epithelium, which has very less of dysplasia. But on the later instances, you see broader ridges, and you get to see keratin plugging also. Still, the amount of dysplasia was very less and we could not identify invasion anywhere. So this case got diagnosed as varicose carcinoma. And the first line that follows is, is it associated Please, considering serorolapidus criteria, this actually is befitting for PVL, which has gone into a case of varicose carcinoma. So we made a mention of PVL. Please consider the previous history of odontogenic keratosis, though I do not know whether that was a you know separate entity in the same area. So when I talk of this, I want to remind you guys, if you get to see these such lesions, which is a cystic lesion, but does not look like varicose carcinoma, it might look much more benign. I would want to remind you of, you know, Dr. Rajgopal's lecture, which was done during the COVID time by IOMP. So he shared a case, case number seven, if I am right, where he told there is an entity called, you know, varicose odontogenic cyst, where you get varicopapillary cystic epithelium, very benign, very subtle, but looks way far away from a OKC. It is not listed in the WHO list, but there are more than a dozen report of this cyst. So if you get such a lesion, more apt to call it as, you know, a varicose odontogenic cyst. But in these lesions also, I would ask, you know, ask you to make a connotation. Please have a recall. We do not know how these lesions go into progression. So this is what this case taught me. So coming to the concluding remarks, Clinical information is vital in these lesions, you know, good to pay attention on exophytic or endophytic growth patterns, see it for yourself, pedunculated or sessile. So this goes with close cooperation of oral surgeons or diagnosticians or clinicians in the clinic. Important to have an adequate biopsy from the appropriate site. So if you just pluck up something very superficial with loads of keratin, I don't know if you should make a diagnosis of PVL, varicose carcinoma of squamous cell carcinoma, because you are just looking at epithelium with proliferation and keratin plugging. Doesn't mean anything. So ask deep, neat biopsies from appropriate site. 
please give a forethought for treatment. So if you have a doubt of PVL or such, take it from the border of lesion. So you see an abrupt change or a PMD association with the present lesion, right? Please do not forget there is a you know proven spectrum of PVL, varicose carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Add on varicose hyperplasia. Don't use it as a diagnostic term, but if you see it clinically associated with PVLs and varicose carcinoma, till proven not guilty, like in our courts. Progressive nature of PVL is humongously bad. Like I told, more than 50 to in our country, generally 70 to 80 percent go into progression of squamous cell carcinoma between the gap of three to eight years, which is actually treacherous. So important to keep this in mind, make a mention of this in your diagnosis, whatever you have made, you know, a diagnosis as histopathology, make a mention of PVLs. And please use indicators which are clinical or histopathological, not only for diagnosis and treatment, but also for prognostication, right? With these few words, I would like to end my presentation. So thank you so much uh, for giving me a patient hearing. I hope I took you on some journey which actually made you think of some new things more than teaching you anything. I would at home want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Sudhakar, Dr. Reshma, Soumya, Dr. Prashant, and also my colleagues at Care Oral Pathology Services, Dr. Soumya and Dr. Satyajit for all the help and all the cases that I get to see. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of the people who have shared this time with me. Uh, I am humbled by that. And thank you so much, Viru and Arvindati College. Thank you, Dr. Radhika, for that uh, wonderful insight on varicopapillary lesions of oral cavity. And I'm sure that all the participants uh, must have got a lot of uh, information from this presentation. And Dr. Radhika has spoken on various classification systems of varicopapillary relations, the diagnostic challenges, and has given important clues about the biological behavior and treatment of these lesions. I hope all of you are happy with the presentation and all of you must have enjoyed. Now, the forum is open for the question and the answers. Whatever question you want to have asked, please type on the right side of the chat box. I'll ask the question to Dr. Radhika on behalf of you all. Any questions, please? So I see the question as, you know, uh, how much of justification for the term varicose squamous cell carcinoma? So like I told, I think we should stick to simpler and clearer terms. Either it is varicose carcinoma or you write it as squamous carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. Then you have the liberty to make a mention that it has a varicose growth pattern. That's okay. But let's not receive using, you know, varicose squamous cell carcinoma or hybrid varicose carcinoma because it doesn't give me clarity on invasion. So still I would prefer let's use squamous cell carcinoma, then make a mention of varicose but with invasive pattern. You can add detailing, but the primary diagnosis is or invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Selway has asked uh, one question. On last case, was the patient tested for TB? Yeah, actually, in this case, we did a whole lot of, you know, uh, from hematological to scrapes. Uh, he was negative for TB. He was negative for immunosuppressive diseases and uh, pass didn't come greatly positive for any of the fungal infection areas. This poor boy was, you know, not at all uh, aware of tobacco usage and all. He was a college boy, actually, and uh, twice has been treated for, you know, recurring odontogenic cyst. So we have given a diagnosis of PVL that has gone into progression of varicose carcinoma. Okay. There is one question from Garima Rawat. Yes, uh, yes. But the CAP protocol classified as varicose squamous cell carcinoma. Yes, uh, so see, there are a lot of see, lot of years in between we use the term KCOT, but now we know the clarity of the term KCOT. It is just back to OKC. So in between, we used you know a lot of terms like varicose hyperplasia, oral florid papillomatosis, and all. But in our country, somehow I am very uh, clear. Let's use simple terms like varicose carcinoma. 
or no, there is dysplasia and invasion. So it is invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So for the ease of understanding of a clinician in any clinic, whether he is a pathologist or not, this gives you a complete clarity what he needs to do with the patient. It, th that is just the intent, not to challenge any name. Okay. Any more questions? I don't see any more questions here. For varicose carcinoma, for me, it just means various variant of squamous cell carcinoma. Then I don't see invasion. Prognosis is good. Zero metastasis. No lymph node positivity. Okay. Thank you, Radhika. I don't see any more questions. Oh, there is thank one you. more question. If yes, there please. is board retail edges can be considered as varicose carcinoma yes yes uh, generally i tell so in varicose papillary lesions all the time we are paying so much attention on the varicose papillary lesions uh, we forget to hold the reference of uh, you know uh, is lamina propria and submucosa being compromised so like you told if you have uh, proliferations that are coming into lamina propria you are seeing it next to minor salivary glands and all you should consider varicose carcinoma then. That is what it is all about. Uh, and one more question from Akshay. Good morning, ma'am. Should the terminology varicose used in proliferative varicose leukoplakia or should yeah. it be called proliferative leukoplakia? Yeah, so there is a very uh, interesting, you know, a lot of uh, literature on this. Uh, people are tired of fighting on the name. <laughs> so like I told, uh, PVLs are called PVL today also. But just between me and you guys, uh, one thing let me tell you, PVL starts as PPL in your mind. Just keep that term. Proliferative, that's okay. But plaque like leukoplakia, it is not varicose actually. So the true name should maybe just, you know, progressive leukoplakia. That's the apt name. But no one is ready to change the name because when it goes to full-blown case, you see it as proliferative varicose leukoplakia. So that's the clarity about the name. For diagnosis, everyone identifies with PVL and uh, Ciroro Lepidra's criteria. So it has stood the test of time. We still maintain it like that. More question. Ma'am, yeah. when do you exactly call it as carcinoma cunicular? The temporal area. Or was there something on the skin? So he told, I am not very sure, but there are, you know, discharging sinuses, which is more relating to infected area. So in these instances where you do not get exophytic lesions, but see a small inverted ulcer, which is growing inwards. And please remember extensive destruction. I have not seen, you know, where a rim of bone is there and there are hundreds of house ships lacuna where the tumor is eating away the bone. And you see these long burrows, which are all pathways filled up with keratin. So just invert a tree. If you see a tree like this, this is your varicose papillary lesion, a varicose carcinoma. You invert the tree into the bone. So those instances, you should actually consider a diagnosis of cuniculatum. And some of the surgeons are smart enough. They tell, Madam, I see extensive pebbly destruction of the bone. Please, you know, look it up for cuniculata. Okay. 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 Thank you, Radhika. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I think Thank there you. are no more questions. Over to Thank Dr. You. Madhura. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Many applauds and appreciation to our resource person, Dr. Radhika M. Bavle, ma'am, for that insightful and excellent presentation. I think uh, we can see the number of uh, images just, uh, in the chat box. Can I just yes, in? There is one more question. So it's like the tail of the yes, elephant. Sir. Let us not get trapped with that. So when, when we look at the term, what a person yeah. So this is very interesting. Very good odontogenic cyst. Yes, yeah. Yes. So when you see a, Please, you know, OKC like cyst, but which is shown, you can actually call it. That's what I remember from Dr. Rajgopal's lecture also. Then maybe you can use the term of varicose odontogenic cyst. There are more than half a dozen cases. You can look up the detail. It looks really subtle, unlike our cases, actually. Then there is one more question by Dr. Yeah. Akriti Shah. Uh, Sir. Yeah. What should be the histopathological diagnosis if the lesion shows no dysplasia? Varicopapillary, small like OH type. Ah, see, so this uh, actually uh, diagnosis, you can give it as, you know, uh, like I told, uh, you use the criteria and first rule out PVL. Okay. 
So that's the first thing I would do in your place. You don't get to see anything like that. You can even use the term of varicose hyperplasia, but be very clear. Are you talking of tobacco associated? Is it because of trauma and irritation? Please make a mention. It's easy to treat. If you do not feel it is associated with you know trauma or irritation, please make a mention. Unknown association of trauma or irritation. Then this keeps the bracket open for the spectrum of varicose hyperplasia or PVL, which can cascade into a much bigger diseases at a later date. Recalls, you know, reconsideration of diagnosis, progression becomes very important in these cases. So shall we close the question and answer session? Sure. Madhura? Madhura? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if there are any more questions, we shall pass it on to the speaker and then madam uh, is sure. happy to answer them. Yeah, I will try my best. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Many applause and appreciation to our resource person, Dr. Radhika Mbagli, ma'am, for that insightful and excellent presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm sure all of us have learned a lot from this session. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Virendra Kumar B for so efficiently moderating the session. Now I would like to request our principal, Dr. Ashar Ayengar, to share her clinical experience in the field of varicopapillary lesions. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Madhura. Uh, yeah, Dr. Radhika, that was a very uh, exhaustive, uh, you know, the surgeons need to plan. So purely by the clinical diagnosis, uh, we cannot decide uh, histopath uh, is the gold standard. So uh, it was uh, from our experience, we know that uh, there are a whole uh, range of lesions like you described, benign ones like squamous papilloma and uh, potentially malignant ones like uh, proliferative varicose leukoplakia and uh, frank uh, malignant ones like varicose carcinoma and uh, uh, the invasive cell, squamous cell carcinoma. So, uh, of course, uh, for a cancerophobic patient who is really fearful of anything appearing in the oral cavity, they may come and they may seek some medical uh, uh, follow-up or medical treatment. But for most people, since these are asymptomatic, they may disregard it and may let it, uh, you know, remain for a long time, may not see it as priority. But definitely you touched upon the fact that how, you know, when you go under the microscope, there is a huge variation of all the possible scenarios which can occur. So I think as clinicians, they should always remember that and you know biopsies and regular follow-ups or recalls of the patient is the order of the day because that's the only way you can uh, prevent uh, larger morbidity or uh, other uh, uh, larger uh, surgical so i think that is very relevant and that is very uh, uh, needed when uh, a patient comes to seek uh, help for this particular oral lesion. So, yeah, I think uh, once again, uh, congratulations and very uh, nicely covered topic and relevant for all of us who are attending. So, uh, thank you again for, you know, enlightening us with this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asha, man, for uh, sharing your valuable uh, clinical experience on and uh, varicopapillary lesions with us. I request our principal to hand over the e-certificate to our speaker, Dr. Radhika Mbavle, as a token of appreciation and as a mark of intense gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Asha, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Radhika, ma'am. I also request our principal to hand over the e-certificate to our moderator of the session, Dr. Virendra Kumar B. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Asha, ma'am. And th thank you, Dr. Virendra, sir. Now it's time to acknowledge and recognize all those who have made this event happen today. First, I would like to thank our management, Rashtriya Shikshana Samiti Trust, and our beloved principal for their continued support uh, for this. My dear colleagues, Dr. Suma S, Dr. Sarita Y, Dr. Vani Das, for all their continuous support and guidance throughout this venture. I'm glad to thank our postgraduate student, Dr. Chandu Nadi, our department technical staff for their continued support. 
I would like to thank Mr. Nityananda and his team, our institutional IT team, uh, for this technical support. I want to thank Dr. Ravish Krishnamurthy, Chief Librarian, for helping us with Information Center. Very many special thanks to Mr. Sunil Chiplunkar, sir, and his team from Group Pharmaceuticals for the incredible support towards this webinar. Thank you so much, Sunil, sir. I want to thank Karnataka State Dental Council for conferring uh, one CD credit point for this program. I'm very happy to thank our elite delegates for being wonderful audience. I want to thank each and every person for making this national webinar a grand success. Before we wind up the session, let me gently remind all the participants to fill up the feedback form sent as a link in the chat box and please submit it. Your feedback is very valuable for us to do better in the days to come. Thank you, everyone. Wish you all a very great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will leave the webinar on for some time till all the feedback forms come in. Others sure. can put off their video. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank sir, you, for your kind support.